So it's my great honor now to introduce Bernie Sanders, the man who has really measured up on the issues for over 40 years and set the standard for progressive values. Bernie Ma is the man of our revolution and the next president of these United States, Bernie Sanders. Thank you. Steve, thank you very much. And let me thank uh, Katie Wagner and Maureen Westrick uh, for their remarks as well. Um, i tell you what we're going to do. I'm going to talk for a few minutes, and then I'll stop. You ask me questions, and I'll ask you questions. How's that? All right. It's an unusual town meeting, but let me know. Um, I thought long and hard along with my wife, and today turns out to be my 31st wedding anniversary day. And my wife kind of thinks I should be in Vermont, but here I am, so. Okay. <laughs> Anyhow, we thought long and hard about, you know, whether or not I should run this time. And we went around the block more than we've ever done on any issue uh, in our lives. Um, and, and we knew that obviously when you get into a campaign, given the nature of politics today, it's a very ugly business out there. You all know that. And do we want to go through that and so forth and so on. And we finally concluded, after really several months of changing our minds on it, that I should run for two reasons. And number one, we concluded, and I believe it is true, uh, that our campaign is the strongest campaign to defeat the worst president in the history of the United States. And I say that you know, that if you look at the polling today, I think almost all of the polls have us ahead of Trump. And most significantly, in those battleground states uh, where Clinton lost, we stand a pretty good chance to win. So that's issue number one, kind of practical, that I thought, not that there aren't other good candidates out there. There are many of them my friends. And I suspect that others could beat Trump as well. But I think we are in maybe the strongest position because the issues that I have been fighting for for years are issues that will resonate, I believe, with the American people, especially in battleground states where Trump should not have won. And that is issues like trade. I have been a leader in the fight against disastrous trade agreements, NAFTA, and permanent normal trade relations with China, which have cost us over the years millions of good paying jobs. Uh, I voted and helped lead the opposition against the worst foreign policy blunder in the modern history of America, and that was the war in Iraq. Um, and we can talk about that a little bit later, but you know, and, and I was early on making the point that climate change is a real threat uh, to our planet, et cetera, et cetera. So I think all of those issues will resonate well in this country where they have to resonate if we're going to beat Trump. Uh, and the second issue, our campaign uh, has, I think, struck a good chord among young people in this country. Uh, and for a couple of reasons. For, for a start, and, and this was never intentionally planned. People ask me, how do you do so well with young people? Did you plan it out? We didn't. But it turns out that two key factors. Number one, it turns out wonderfully, I think, that our young people in, in this country today are the most uh, idealistic uh, young generation in the modern history of this country. And they are anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-homophobic, anti-xenophobic. <laughs> and we should be very proud of that. You know. And the second reason is a little bit more mundane. And that is that everything being equal, that generation, the younger generation, is going to have a lower standard of living than their parents. 
So they love their parents, but they do not necessarily want to be poorer than their parents. And that's sometimes we don't pay attention. Those kids are graduating school deeply in debt. Is in many cases, the jobs they get in real dollars will pay less than the, the jobs their parents had. Uh, they're having a hard time finding affordable housing, buying a house that they could afford, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that combination uh, has resonated. That combination of factors has led a lot of young people to our message. And to beat Trump, we need a very large voter turnout. We need to bring more and more young people into the political process. The good news is we are having some success. 2018 had the largest voter turnout among young people in a very, very, very long time. But on the other hand, we started off quite low. We've got to go a lot higher. And we're working on that. So those are the factors that I think uh, make me perhaps the strongest candidate uh, to defeat uh, Donald Trump. Something that has to happen, that's for sure. Second point that I want to make is I want to thank the people of New Hampshire very much for the great victory they gave us uh, four years ago. And I'll tell you why that victory was so important. Because when we began the campaign and we came into Iowa and we came into New Hampshire, many of the ideas that I was talking about seemed to mainstream media and, and uh, establishment politicians to be radical and extreme ideas. And you may remember that I talked about raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Oh my God, how radical can you be? Well, you're laughing now because over four years that radical idea has been accepted by seven states and the Congress is gonna vote for it. And I talked about making public colleges and universities tuition free and reducing student debt. Well. All over the country, you're seeing states and communities moving in exactly that uh, direction. Uh, we talked about an idea where we have made a lot of progress, and that is making it clear that health care is a human right, not a privilege. And poll after poll shows that a majority of Americans now support the concept of a Medicare for all single payer program. And we talked about climate change as an existential threat to the planet uh, before a lot of other people were talking about that issue. And now I don't think anyone debates that it is an unbelievable threat to our country and the entire world. In criminal justice, and immigration reform, uh, and the need to rebuild our crumbling infrastructure. A lot of those ideas that we brought forth four years ago have now been accepted by the American people and many uh, Democrats running for, you know, everything from dog catcher on up are kind of campaigning on those issues. But those issues would not have swept the American public and the political life of this country if it was not for states like New Hampshire that said, you know what, we hear what Bernie is saying, and these are not radical ideas, these are the ideas that the American people need. So thank you, New Hampshire. <laughs> so we're running uh, to win, obviously, the Democratic primary, we're running to defeat Donald Trump, but we're also running to do something very different, and I want to be clear and honest about that as well. I think one of the problems that happens in American politics is that a lot of folks, well-intentioned and honest, they run for office and they say, look, I'm going to do A, B, C, and D. People vote them in, and A, B, C, and D does not happen, and people get discouraged. So I want to be very honest with you. The message of our campaign is us, not me. Now, why do I say that? I know it's a nice sounding phrase. Could be a bumper sticker, probably will be a bumper sticker. <laughs> but it is, actually, it is actually a very profound statement. And I didn't come up with the phrase, but somebody on my staff did. What do I mean 
what are the implications and what do I mean by us, not me? Who wants to take a shot at that? What do I mean by that? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. All right. All right. Everybody, please stand up and say that. I think it means two things. That's one is exactly what it means. And I think I'm the only candidate who will tell you this, because you're not going to see it on television for reasons that are part of what I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> it's to who owns TV and stuff like that. But we are, what we have got to deal with, which most candidates don't, is the power structure of America. Do you know what I mean by that? Do you know what the power of Wall Street is? Do you know what the power of the drug companies are? Do you know what the power of the insurance companies, the military industrial complex, the fossil fuel industry? Do you think somebody's going to come before you and say, look, I am deeply concerned about climate change, and I want to transform our energy system, vote for me? Well, that's a fine phrase. It's a fine speech. But it, what is not in that speech is the need to take on the fossil fuel industry, because they do not go gently into the sunset. So the point that I'm making when I say us, not me, is I need your help to win the primary, I need your help to win the general election. But I ain't letting you off the hook after that. I need your help the day after the election. All right. You know, one of the points that we make throughout this campaign, and I'll answer questions on it if you want, is we pay the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs, all right? Everybody knows. They're getting ripped off by the pharmaceutical industry, okay? They made top 10 companies, made 69 billion in profits last year. 69 billion, top 10 companies, and you pay by far the highest prices in the world, and one out of five Americans cannot afford the medicine their doctors prescribe. How crazy is that? But do you think, you know, my belief is, and I will fight and make happen, that we're going to lower prescription drug costs by half. We're going to bring them down to the rest of the world. That's all. Not a radical idea. But do you think the pharmaceutical India is going to cave in and say, oh, gee, Bernie, we've been thinking about it. And you're right. We have been selfish and greedy, and we have allowed people to die and get sick while we make billions. You have convinced us, and we're going to lower prices by 50%. Now, Maybe, but I don't think so. All right? I think we need millions of people to stand with me because they have incredible power and unlimited. I've dealt with these guys. Unlimited amounts of money. You'll see all kinds of ugly ads soon uh, here in New Hampshire. Okay. So what us, not me, is that no matter how well-intentioned a person may be, and we have a lot of well-intentioned candidates, you have got to understand that no president can do it alone. And it's not because they're liars or they're bad people. It means that they're taking on unbelievable wealth and power. And what I believe, if you study the history of America and all of the ways that profound change has come about, the labor movement, the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the gay movement, the environmental movement, None of that happened from the top on down. It always happened from the bottom on up. And that's what we need right now. And the other part of us, not me, is also profound. And that is, you know, what Donald Trump kind of believes is, look, he made billions, or maybe he didn't make billions. We don't know, whatever it is. But, Greed is good, and you're all in this yourself, and you're going to rob and steal and lie, and someday you may make a whole lot of money. And then when you have a whole lot of money, you can lobby in Congress and tell Congress to cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid to give you tax breaks. That's the American way. All right? I don't believe that. And when we talk about us, not me, what well, it's a simple concept, and that is I want you to be concerned about my four kids and my seven grandchildren, and I've got to be concerned about your families and your problems that we're in this as a nation. And the good news is we are the wealthiest nation in the history of the world. And we should be able to do a hell of a lot of good things for each other. So with that, any questions you got? Ma'am, right over there. Yes. Yes. Just stand up and give us your name, please.
be a little bit louder so I can hear you, but I want everybody to hear you. Oh, just be loud then, all right. Okay. To protect, to protect our children, our grandchildren, and our democracy. I spent the morning at the State House today. I worked with other ad, um, advocates, and we went to the, to the State House, to the Senate office building. We are working on a, a bill to call on Washington, our lep representatives in Washington, to get that, com that amendment passed. Um, we're hoping that in two weeks, that bill will be, out, will be voted on and we can send it to Washington. My question to you is, will you join us in support of this constitutional amendment by allowing us to publish your name on our website along with that of U.S. Representative Chris Pappas and presidential candidate John Delaney? Will you join them? All right. Let me, I don't mean to be wielding out of the question. Let me. There's nobody who's running who feels more strongly about the power of money in politics, who believes that we have got to overturn this disastrous Citizens United Supreme Court decision, who believes in public funding of elections, who will work to end voter suppression in this country and excessive gerrymandering in this country. We'll sit down and let me take a look at that. Okay. Uh, gentleman right here. Yeah. No, I haven't actually, but go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in general, this is the story. If the question is, do I believe in a Medicare for all publicly funded healthcare system? Absolutely, positively, and unequivocally. Now, the question of funding is a complicated issue because we're talking about a whole lot of money. Right now, how do we pay for healthcare? Who wants to help me on that one? How do we pay for it? We paid, <laughs> that's for sure. Roughly speaking, give or take, about half of the money already comes from uh, taxes from the government because that's Medicaid, Medicare veterans, et cetera, public health programs. The other half you pay for your private premiums, yeah? You pay for your deductibles, your co-payments, your out-of-pocket expenses. That's kind of how we pay for it. So first point when we talk about funding of health care, is we are now spending about twice as much per person on health care as do the people of any other country, okay? So we are spending a fortune. We're spending about $11,000 per person, $3.5 trillion a year. Estimates are that that's gonna go up in years to come. Now, what I believe is we should move to a Medicare for All system, which does the following. For a start, it will improve Medicare for the elderly by covering dental care, eyeglasses, and hearing aids. Okay? That's what it will do. And in its first year, it will lower the age of eligibility for Medicare from 65 to 55, cover all of the children in one program, Move then now, the next year, down to 45, down to 35, and then cover everybody in America, four-year period. Now, you're asking a fair question. How do you pay for that? Well, what we have chosen not to do, because it would just engender enormous debate, is to tell you how I'm going to raise every nickel uh, in a $3.5 trillion budget. That's something that is going to have to be discussed. So I wanted to lay out the program as to what it would mean, and to tell you that it will cost you and ordinary Americans a lot less than you are currently spending on average, okay? What it will probably end up looking like is a payroll tax on employers, an increase in income tax in a progressive way 
for ordinary people with a significant deductible for low-income people who pay nothing for it. Upper-income people will pay more. But at the end of the day, these are, what, these are the issues we have to deal with, and admittedly, this is a complicated issue. We've been wrestling with it for years. Number one, is health care a human right or is it not? Yeah. All right. So if we agree that just because he is rich and she is poor that he can get the best health care in the world and she can't afford to go to the doctor, if we think that that is wrong, which most Americans do, then we need to cover everybody with health care. Number two, the function of the current health care system is what? Thank you. All right. That's it. In about two words, you got it. So you'll all be delighted to know that the top five insurance companies last year made $20 billion in profit, that the guy who was head of Aetna engineered a merger with CVS, and for his work, he got $500 million out of your health care dollars. Some of us think we could do a lot more with $500 million in terms of doctors and nurses and lowering prescription drug costs, but he got $500 million. Head of United Health makes $83 million a year, et cetera. All right, so the function of our health care system is quality care for all, free choice of doctor and hospital, and paying, it, paying for that in a public way. And we save very substantial sums of money because we're not going to be paying people to hound you for the back bills that you owe the hospital. We're going to be putting that money into the delivery of health care. Okay, gentleman right there, yeah. How much I really appreciate, and I know all Democrats, all Americans really must appreciate all you've done from four years ago and 40 years ago to make these issues, to make all of the issues you're talking about part of the national conversation and something that is acceptable. It's mainstream now. That is just a wonderful thing. Um, I want to ask you if you could also take the lead in an issue that I'm very concerned about, and that is immigration policy. I think it's one of the most inhumane and un-American things that is going on in this country now. And we talk about Donald Trump and all of the things that are terrible about him. But I think the immigration policy is one of the worst and it is just you go to the statue you see the statue of liberty and you think this is what america is all about my grandparents everybody's parents were immigrants at one time or another unless we're native american and uh what we're doing keeping children in cages and saying brown people are not welcome in this country people who wear hijabs aren't even welcome in the united states congress it is really unacceptable not that Ilhan Omar is an immigrant, but uh, the, the racism and xenophobia is terrible. I've been down to Homestead and spent a uh, number of days there, and Homestead is only 29 miles from Miami, where you and the other Democrats are going to be debating uh, in a few weeks. And I'm hoping that you will agree to make a side trip to Homestead, bring some of your fellow candidates, and really put this on the front burner and let American people know that this is just not what we should be standing for. Children should not be separated from their families, right. should not be kept incarcerated. Good. We should right. welcome people. You know, we can, and I don't want to, but we, you know, we could talk about Trump all day and all of the absurd things that he does and the embarrassing things that he does. But at the end of the day, I think the ugliest thing that he is doing is not just giving tax breaks to billionaires and not just trying to throw millions of people off of health care and ignoring climate change, but it's exactly what you talked about. And this is what demagogues have always done. We don't want to give credit, we don't want to give Trump the credit for coming up with a new idea. This is not a new idea. This has existed for God knows how many years in Europe, all over the world where you take minorities, sometimes they're black and sometimes they're Jewish and sometimes they're Muslim, whatever they may be. You take a minority and you try to get people to hate that minority. And that is a pretty ugly thing to do. And right now, uh, at the top of his list, of course, is, is immigrants and undocumented people. So let me just say this. Actually, I'm going to be in California in a few days, and I'm going to be speaking just on that issue. 
So pay attention to what I say. But at the end of the day, uh, there is no question that what's happening at the border is un-American. We should not be a country that snatches babies out of the arms of their mothers. That's not what America is supposed to be about. So we need, you know, we need a humane uh, border policy which treats those who seek asylum with respect and dignity. Uh, we need to move to a comprehensive immigration reform, which, by the way, you know, this is interesting. Trump keeps demonizing. That's what the American people want, all right? You, know, you want to throw everybody out in this country? Well, kind of anticipate that the price of the food you're paying is going to go up double or triple, all right? Because those are the people who are picking the crops right now, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it is a major issue. Uh, I have talked about it. I will talk about it more comprehensively. And I thank you for raising it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, ma'am, right there. Yes. Judy, I think we're going to get you a mic there. And, um, I was at the first Earth Day in 1970 and was at the first White House conference on climate change in 1994. And um, we have known that this issue is very real for a very long time. We can see it, those of us who are ecologists and look at the world, we see it every day in what we, we observe in the outdoors. What are the three things that you're going to do about climate change in your first week in office? And, se and secondly, um, how are you uh, offsetting your carbon uh, on this campaign? Well, actually, I think we are, uh, as a matter of fact offsetting our carbon use. But uh, look, here is the issue. It's an issue I have been talking about for years, and I just talked about it a moment ago. Uh, anybody who thinks that climate change is not real, is not caused by human activity, is not already causing devastating problems, just doesn't know what's going on in the world and hasn't read any of the scientific uh, reports. So to answer your question, it's not good enough for me to tell you all the things I'm going to do. That's a fair question. But to tell you that it cannot be done unless we have a political movement prepared to take on the greed and irresponsibility of the fossil fuel industry. Because otherwise, you're not going to accomplish anything. I can give you a 10-hour speech about the dangers of fossil fuel and how we have to transform our energy away from fossil fuel. But it doesn't happen unless we have a political movement that says, we are transforming our energy system, whether the fossil fuel industry likes it or not. So that's what I will be doing. The second thing that I will be doing, and I don't know if I'm engaged in wishful thinking on this, but I want you to share at least this dream with me, that climate change is not an American issue. Obviously, it is a global issue. And unfortunately and dangerously and tragically, we have a president who not only is not addressing the issue, he is making it worse, okay? Now what about having a president like Bernie Sanders who says to the world, we are in this together. Not an American issue, it's not a Russian issue, not a Chinese issue. And how about, you know, maybe I'm engaged in wishful thinking here, I don't know. But how about instead of spending a trillion and a half dollars a year on weapons of destruction designed to kill each other, maybe we start using that money to transform our energy system. You know, who knows? Who knows? I mean, because this is if there is something that brings us together. I mean, this China, huge problems with pollution, you know that, in, in Russia and Latin America, my God, what's going on there. Maybe this could be the mechanism by which we bring people together. And, and certainly, as the President of the United States, that's exactly what I'd be attempting uh, to do. Okay, other questions? Uh, yeah, young lady right there, Red, yes. which means that I prioritize civil liberties when I vote. Um, I want to know that um, if, as president, would you support the um, legal recognition of a third gender marker X federally? Yeah. 
<laughs> the answer is yes. I don't know. We, you know, it, it, it's, okay. But I want to just, want, no, 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 I want to get to one point, all right, before you answer. I mean, everything that I'm talking about is trying to create a non-discriminatory society, all right, that's all. So it's not just discrimination against women or blacks or gays or anybody else, it's discrimination against everybody. But can I take issue with your question? You ready? Okay. You say that that is, when you vote, that's a major issue for you. What I would ask people to think about, look, we are in a very difficult moment in American history, and there are many, many issues that are out there. And we have got to be thinking kind of holistically you're interested in climate change, right? You're interested in making college affordable, right? All right, so there are a lot of issues that are out there. And sometimes we all get caught up, everyone has an issue, and they're all important. But let's kind of bring them together in what I call a progressive agenda. Okay, a progressive agenda, which certainly includes civil liberties big time. In, in fact, the guy who's my campaign manager is the former political director of the ACLU, so it's of some significance to me. Okay, uh, but, but, all right, now you're asking me questions, I don't have a chance to ask you questions. <laughs> all right, it's not fair. You invited, <laughs> just, no, I invited you here, you didn't invite me here, so. Uh, let me ask you a question. See, one of the things that always a, a real issue is, you go on TV, I go on TV, somebody's, well, I read in there, President Trump sent out a tweet today, what do you think about it? Okay, well, uh, or this is the news of the day. What do you think about it? And I kind of don't look at politics like that. I look at the news of the decade, the news of the century, the news of the last 500,000 years, you know, huge trends that are taking place, not just the front page story today. Okay, what do I mean by that? What I mean is that sometimes we get um, involved in an issue, uh, and it may not be the most important issue. It's important, but may not be the most important. And one of the areas I have talked about a lot, it's not talked about on media at all, and that's another issue, uh, and that is income and wealth inequality. All right? Is that an important issue? Okay, now I'm gonna give you some facts. Facts. Three families in America own more wealth than the bottom half of the American people. Fact, the top 1% owns more wealth than the bottom 92%. Fact, 49% of all new income as opposed to wealth, income, is going to the top 1%. Is that important? Why don't we talk about it? That's my question. You hope, uh, stand up. Who said that? Yeah. Yep. And that is true, but it's also not talked about in Congress. Why isn't it talked about? It? In other words, you know. Okay. So sometimes my point here is that we get trapped into thinking that what TV tells us or what the front pages of the paper tell us are the important issues and we begin to doubt our own instincts. How can it not be an important issue when three families own more wealth than the bottom half of America and when the top 1% in private corporations are able to exert enormous influence over our political system, which was the first question that was asked this evening. Obviously, it is important, but we don't talk about it a lot. So let's talk about it just for a minute. What do we think? If I tell you three families are more wealth than the bottom half, let me tell you, I'm going to be a week from tomorrow. I'm going to be in Bentonsville, Arkansas. Anyone know why I'm going to be in Bentonsville, Arkansas? That's right. I was invited to be there by Walmart workers who own stock in the company and have asked me to represent them before the Board of Directors of Walmart. And here is the story with Walmart that you don't hear about terribly much, and that is the wealthiest family in the country is the Walton family. 
but they pay workers wages that are so low that many of those workers are forced to go on food stamps, Medicaid, and, and public housing. And who pays for that? Do you think it makes sense for working people to have to subsidize the wealthiest family in the country? Because no. nobody does, except the wealthiest family in the country. They think it's a good idea. All right, so those are the kinds of issues which speak to a rigged economy and massive levels of income and wealth inequality. I want to spend another minute on it. Now, I'm going to answer your question, but stay with me on this one. All right, talk to me about what does that level, that grotesque level of income and wealth inequality mean to this country, and why don't we talk about it more? Other thoughts on that issue? I'm going to stay on that issue. We on it? Sir? Can we get him a mic? Do we have mics? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Sanders, for being here. Thank you for running yet again. Uh, in 1937, a very conservative Supreme Court spoke to the very issue that you're talking about right now. It was the West Coast Hotel versus Parish case. In that case, the Supreme Court uh, um, said two important things. One is to pay less than a living wage imposes an unfair burden on the balance of society that must, with their tax dollars, pay for the underpaid worker. Hmm. That was 1937. I'm 62 years old, a little bit younger than you, Senator. I've never heard any politicians reference this Supreme Court case, and Supreme Court cases, as you know, are important in the context of our lives today. They said one more important thing. They said if a company cannot afford to pay their employees a living wage, they ought not be in business. Well, you know what? Repeat that. What was that case? Third. West Hotel? West Coast Hotel. Okay. I have not heard of that decision. Thank you. All right. I should have. But that's... Okay. A few more comments on that issue, then I'll go back to your questions. Anything more on income and wealth inequality? Yes. You got a mic coming right there. Um, I'm Harold Pope. Uh, lifelong resident in uh, New Hampshire. Uh, thank you for coming today. Um, I was listening to an interview with um, Andrew Yang, who I guess is running for president as well. And he was mentioning that like with Amazon, for instance, that they, uh, their fulfillment center is all going automated and that therefore you know, they can afford to lay off a bunch of workers where it used to be done by hand and by manual labor. And I just w was hoping that, you know, that they are saying too that the, all the, the jobs are heading, you know, are being farmed out to uh, overseas and that um, the, the issue there being is that um, it's real hard for people to worry about climate change and, and the penguins when they can't even pay, when they're living paycheck to paycheck or hand to mouth. Okay. Um, well, you, you raised a couple of important issues, not the least of which uh, Congress, and I think the media, has not done a particularly good job and looking at the transformation of society that is rapidly approaching as a result of robotics and artificial intelligence. Now, there are you know, writers who have different points of view as the, you know, some people say, yeah, it's gonna change, but there'll be new jobs created as we lose. You know, it's like going from the, uh, you know, the horse and buggy to the car, you're gonna lose jobs and you gain jobs. Other people say no, uh, that technology is going to be so productive uh, that there simply will be less work for human beings. But I think that speaks to the need to begin the discussion by saying in one way or another, and that's what the debate is about, 
that every person in this country is entitled to a decent standard of living because they are an American citizen. Okay, and then we can figure that means health care for all, guaranteed. It means educational opportunity for all, guaranteed. It means decent housing for all, guaranteed. And, and how we can create the kinds of jobs that we need that address our society's problems means guaranteed jobs for people who are able to work at the federal level, working on that as well. So this whole issue of robotics raises profound questions that we have not begun to address, and we've got to move on that pretty quickly. Okay, gentlemen, way in the back there. Yes, sir. Bernie, a couple of, oh, about 10 days ago, I heard on, I think it was NPR, that 300 of our UN scientists who are specialists in uh, biodiversity are saying that we are possibly going to lose somewhere between 500,000 and a million species in the next 10 years. I, I, I assume that you heard that too. Yes. Well, if that's the case, all these other issues you're talking about are mute. Okay, we don't have time to do anything unless we have a grassroots global revolution that says, no more! Well, I use a word that I've not used before. I call it climate change and the loss of biodiversity as existential threats to this planet. And it is incredibly, you know, I, I, I keep saying this thing, but I don't want any of you to be in a position where 30 or 40 years from now, your grandchildren say to you, you knew about what was gonna happen. There it was. Here is the newspaper. They told you that in 2019, and you did nothing. And you allowed me and my kids to be living in a world which is an environmental disaster. Shame on you. And that's why we've gotta respond right now. That's why you know I talk about the need for an absolutely aggressive, you know, I was proud to be, you know, you know, one of the supporters of the Green New Deal uh, legislation. But we need, <laughs> you're right in saying that if we're not going to have much of a planet to leave our grandchildren, what else are we talking about, right? Uh, the problem is there's a zillion other issues, but that is, that's right. And we have got to address that. Okay, other questions? Yes, ma'am, right here. When talking about climate change, a lot of people overlook the fact, um, the part that the animal agriculture business has to play in that. I was just wondering what your views are and how you would help combat the impact of that that industry has, whether that be through action or education, and how you can help spread the awareness of that. I can't give you. <laughs> You make a, a good point, and that has to be part, an essential part of, of, of the discussion. Uh, and I think you'll find that a lot of farmers, um, I was out in Iowa talking about this last month, that a lot of farmers are, for a variety of reasons, extremely sensitive and knowledgeable about what climate change is doing to them and want to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. Okay, uh, yes, gentlemen over there. Hello, sir. My name is Richard Allen. I'm a 41-year-old college student who came back to college because I couldn't find a good paying job. In the past couple of months, one of the statistics I've seen is college graduates as a whole are 40% underemployed. It is one thing to have affordable college tuition, but it's another thing if they can't get a job to help them pay off those student loans afterwards. Yes. How can we fix this? I'll tell you how we can fix it. We can fix it in two ways. For a start, uh, legislation that I have introduced would not only make public colleges and universities tuition free, but by imposing a transaction fee on Wall Street speculation, substantially reduce student debt. So for a start, your life would be a little bit easy if you didn't have to pay off your student debt. Okay, but second of all, you raised the question about jobs. And one of the uh, things that I believe in and will do as president is 
what FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, talked about a long, long time ago in the 30s and 40s. And that is to guarantee a job to everybody in this country who is prepared to work at a decent wage. All right, now think about, think about the unmet needs that are in this country. Let me just start with the children, okay? We have a child care disaster in this country. You all know that? All right, there's a mom who knows that or did know that. And that is that affordable child care in Vermont, New Hampshire, all over this country is impossible to obtain. And many of our kids are not getting the quality child care that they need. We need a huge number of people to work in child care at a living wage, not the starvation wage that child care workers are now making. How many people knew, how many of you know, maybe you know more than I do, that in many parts of this country it is hard for school districts to attract teachers because the wages are so low? You know that, okay? So imagine if we had a rational educational policy which says that teaching is one of the most important professions there is out there and we're going to pay those teachers the kind of salaries that they deserve so they don't have to work one or two other jobs and don't have to take money out of their own pockets to buy supplies for their classrooms. How's about that? And then we got an infrastructure out there, and that is our roads, our bridges, our water systems. You know, I didn't know this. I got to tell you, you know, one of the things, if you ever want to learn something, you should run for president. I shouldn't be saying that. That's why everybody's running for president. They want to, can't afford to go to college, so they're going to run for president. But, all right. But my point's, I didn't know. I really didn't know. You know, I live in Burlington, Vermont. We turn on the water, turn on the water top, and the water is pretty good. Did you know that all over this country, people cannot drink the water that comes out of their tap? I mean, well, Flint is, is the, you know, canary in the coal mine on that one. That is true, and I don't want to get into Flint. I was there. It is a horror story. But you think, well, okay, we've got an exception to the rule. You had a governor who did something stupid or whatever it was. Flint. It ain't just Flint. That's my point. It is community after community after community. All right. We got to rebuild our infrastructure. And by the way, when I talk about infrastructure, I mean rebuilding crumbling schools. I mean building affordable housing. So you want jobs? All right, that's jobs. You want more jobs? When we aggressively tackle climate change, we need to weatherize buildings all over this country. We need to move aggressively to wind and solar, and let's build those products here in the United States of America. Those are jobs. We need more doctors and nurses and dentists and people in those professions. Those are jobs. We are an aging population, and we need people to take care of our parents and our grandparents. Those are jobs. And those can be good paying jobs. Here's something that I learned also. See, it's a great educational experience. I was in uh, Nevada uh, when I ran the first time. And it turns out that in Nevada, in Las Vegas, we have all the casinos and everything else. They are very heavily unionized. And it's a good, strong union. And the workers there who make the beds, who clean the toilets, these are lowly jobs. They make middle class wages and have excellent health care benefits and have pensions as well. Point is, it's not the work you do. In this case, it's having a good union behind you. So to answer your question, there are millions of jobs, important jobs. What's more important than teaching? or converting our energy system away from fossil fuel, or rebuilding our infrastructure, or taking care of our parents and our grandparents, or being a doctor or a nurse. All of those are enormously important jobs. All of those sectors now are undef underfunded. And my intention is, as President of the United States, to fundamentally change the priorities 
of this country. Instead of investing endless amounts of money in endless wars, we're going to start investing in our people and in those jobs. And instead of giving a trillion and a half dollars in tax breaks to the 1% and to profitable private corporations, we're going to start investing in the working people of this country. So with that, with that, I am going to apologize, but we have to hit the road. Uh, I just wanted to thank all of you very much for being here. Let's go forward together. Thank you.